All right. Um, welcome, everyone. We're at a, another training session of United Way 211, um, facilitated by Call for Justice. I'm Ellie Krug, uh, the Executive Director of Call for Justice. I am thrilled today to present our speaker on sticky family law issues. Her name is Melissa Hotelling. Melissa is an attorney practicing in St. Paul. She has um, a, a BA degree from Hamlin University and a law degree from William Mitchell College. She, is, um, she specializes in family law and has uh, talked on a number of uh, subjects relating to family law. My very favorite subject that she's, ta she's talked on is a presentation entitled, quote, From Cradle to Grave and All the Drama in Between, Family Planning for LGBT uh, Couples. Um, she has uh, authored a book, um, Estate Planning for Non-Traditional Families, um, which is quite an accomplishment. She did that um, in less than three years of practicing law as a lawyer. She is the, uh, the 2012 recipient of the National LGBT Bar Association's 40 Best LGBT Attorneys Under the Age of 40 Award. That's a long title, but that is a very significant distinction for our speaker. She's also um, a Cali Award um, in Feminist Jurisprudence winner from William Mitchell College. Uh, Melissa uh, spoke yesterday. She's back again today to give us the same presentation. Help me welcome Melissa, please. All right. Well, thank you for having me here to talk to you a little bit about family law issues and some of the more perhaps unique questions that you might get when you're receiving phone calls from individuals. Um, I actually teach family law at Inver Hills Community College to paralegals, and I teach legal research and writing at Hamlin University, um, just as part-time jobs because being a lawyer isn't busy enough. But um, what I really like is if we can, if you guys have questions, just please feel free to interrupt me. You can or cannot raise your hand. It's up to you, whatever your comfort level is. Um, as an attorney, we interrupt each other all the time, so I won't <laughs> be offended if you just jump in. And um, I interrupt her all the time. Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I will pause and I will listen, so I won't talk over you. Um, so I, I really welcome you to ask questions as we go through, because you are the ones who are receiving the questions, and I want to make sure that you're getting the information that you need in order to do your job. I know what I want to tell you, but it might not be what you guys need to hear in order to really get something out of the session. Um, I always tell people that practicing in family law has given me an understanding of why attorneys are called counselors. Um, I think that attorneys are called counselors because, particularly in family law, it's wrought with emotion and you're dealing with people's everyday lives you're dealing with their kids and you're dealing with their relationships so um, it's also sometimes feels a little bit like soap opera law um, just because it can it can be relatively dramatic and individuals you know when you have interpersonal relationships that are trying to um, be combined with some sort of legal construct that's been created by the legislature it can get really tricky and one of the things that you will probably hear over and over again is a judge did this or my ex did this and it's not fair. Um, and what I always tell my clients is the law is not fair. It really isn't. We do the best we can to make things equitable, which doesn't mean equal. So equal means 50-50. Equitable means both parties are leaving in a position that they can continue to care for themselves. Um, but by no means is it fair, um, much like life most of the time. Um, when we talk about family law, family law encompasses much more than just divorces. So you may get phone calls about things like legal separations, um, paternity actions, custody, parenting time, and child support are usually the big ones. There's also some adoptions out there, but you probably wouldn't be getting calls about adoptions. Um, it also includes third-party custody or grandparent custody and grandparent visitation or third-party visitation. What those terms mean are it's usually an individual who is not a biological or legal parent to the child who is trying to assert some sort of either time with a child or custodial rights. So they need to be making decisions for a child that they have somehow become connected to or who is living in their home. So more and more I see um, cases that I'm taking that are on this sort of third party custody visitation tract. Um, and the reason for that is we have parents who aren't able to care for their kids or no longer want to care for their kids, or people are just more and more choosing not to get married. 
Um, it could be partly because people hear about what the divorce rate is and they don't want to go through divorce. Well, if you have kids together, it doesn't matter whether you have been married or not married, you still have to deal with the court system when you're dealing with the issues related to the kids. Um, that being said, what's really important for people to know is that even if they've written some sort of agreement themselves um, with regard to child support or custody, it's not enforceable at all unless a judge has also sanctioned it. So the parties can come to an agreement, but it needs to be submitted to a judge and the judge has to sign off on it before it's an enforceable agreement, which sometimes people get confused about um, because they say, oh, well, this is how we've been doing it or this has been our agreement and this is how much he was paying me or she was paying me in child support and we agreed to something different. Well, unless the court says, okay, you can do something different, it doesn't count. Um, but going back to the beginning, Typically, how people start in these actions um, is if they've been married, they either file for a legal separation or they file for divorce. Now, the difference between legal separation and divorce in Minnesota is actually relatively limited. Um, there's more similarities, I would say, than differences. And the big difference that you have to understand is that with a legal separation, um, you're still married at the end of the proceedings. So if you file for a legal separation, you deal with all the same stuff, so custody, parenting time, property division, retirement funds, health insurance, um, real estate, all of those things are dealt with in a legal separation, but at the end of the day, you're still married to this other person. People choose legal separation for a number of reasons, and I think the two most common reasons are either uh, religious beliefs, so they have strong religious convictions that they should not be divorced, um, but they, their relationship isn't working out and they want to live separately and they need to figure out how to do that. Or um, if there's some sort of financial or economic reason um, that they can't separate. So sometimes elderly people, their relationships isn't working out, they don't want to be together anymore, but they need to keep that marital status for one reason or another. And, and it's one of those things where um, it depends on the particular client's circumstances as to why they might need a legal separation. Most of the time when I have clients come in and they initially meet with me and they say they want a legal separation, it's usually because they're just not to that point of, I'm ready to file for a divorce. But once I explain to them, you can do the legal separation, but then at the point in the future when you do want to terminate your marriage, you then have to file your divorce papers and you can revisit a lot of the stuff that you've already, what you've already thought you've hashed out previously in the legal separation. So then they see it as going through the proce procedures and processes twice and they then tend to change to just say, okay, I'm gonna do the divorce. The other thing is, is if you've done a legal separation, you can't remarry um, until you have a final divorce decree. And so that can also be a hindrance for people as well. Um, because they want to date and they feel like it's wrong if they find out that on paper they're still married even if they're legally separated they find that dating is um, not something that they're willing to do unless they are fully divorced or going through the divorce process. Now for any of these processes um, whether it's establishing custody, child support, getting a divorce or a legal separation the way that the actions are started is by serving um, the opposing party with either um, a petition or a motion. Most of the time it's done with a petition and you also include a summons with that. So those are the two documents that start it. And what's unique to Minnesota is that an action is actually started when the person is served, not when it's filed with the court. And there are a number of reasons why people choose to serve and then file at some point later. Um, sometimes it's for negotiation purposes, sometimes um, it's for cost reasons because they want to get the conversation started about divorce, so they want to let the other person know that I'm going to do this, but they don't want the court involved quite yet because a lot of conversations take place outside of court to try to figure out how these two people are going to come apart. So it's important to know um, that just because somebody's been served with a summons and petition, it may not have been filed yet, which may cause some confusion for individuals. If it's been filed, 
both parties will receive a notice from the court telling them that it's been filed. Even if you're not represented by an attorney, it gets sent to the person's home address saying it's been filed with the court, you're gonna get another notice soon about who your judge is and about something called an initial case management conference. Um, an initial case management conference usually takes place uh, about four weeks, four to five weeks after the initial filing of the divorce petition. Um, what an initial case management conference is, is it's an informal meeting with the judge who's assigned to the case where you talk about things like what sort of alternative dispute resolution are you going to engage in, also called ADR. So initial case management conferences are called ICMCs. Um, Alternative dispute resolution is called ADR. So you might hear people reference these things and you'll want to know where they are in the process when they call you, um, just so you can send them to the right resource depending on what their needs might be. If they haven't even started yet, um, haven't even filed for the divorce, they're wondering how they get going on it. One of the things that I would recommend to people is that they go to one of the classes that are held at either Cornerstone um, or at Chrysalis and Tubman Family Alliance. They're usually like three hour, divorce information sessions, and it kind of gives you the quick and dirty about what divorce is in Minnesota and how to get it started. You can also go to a self-help center and find out um, the appropriate documents that should be filled out, and there's somebody there who will guide people to the right information. Um, but sometimes it's just that getting started point that people have a real hard time with. Other times it's, okay, well, I received this notice. What does this mean? So if you can tell them an oh, initial case management conference you know, is a meeting with the judge, that's probably gonna put their mind at ease. If you also tell them it's pretty informal and no contested issues can be heard at that hearing. So you can't go in there and argue about um, what the current schedule is or what child support is. You don't get to do any of those things. All you can do is put on the record if there's agreements. You can put agreements on the record with the judge. Um, and you say, here's what I wanna do for alternative dispute resolution. Um, the other, thing that the judge will do at an initial case management conference is explain to the parties what all of this stuff is. So if you have a lawyer, hopefully the lawyers are explaining that. And most of the family law attorneys that I oppose or work with um, do a good job of explaining to their clients before you get to this conference sort of what the judge is gonna tell them. If they're gonna be pro se or unrepresented by an attorney, um, they're not gonna have as much information. And what I found is that judges are, take, they take their job really seriously, but they want these cases off of their calendar as quickly as possible. They're completely you know, overwhelmed by the number of cases that are filed and court appearances bog up the court calendar. And so they wanna get people on a resolution path as quickly as possible. And at that first meeting, um, they've never met the people before. They're usually pretty, open and honest about what the next steps are gonna be, kind to the individuals who are there and making sure that they understand what the process should be. And so although you know going to court seems like a scary prospect to a lot of people, it's not like Judge Judy or Judge Joe Brown where they're gonna yell at you and you know have you present evidence or anything like that. Um, a couple of the options that are currently given to people at initial case management conferences are called uh, early neutral evaluations. And there's two different kinds of early neutral evaluations. There's the social early neutral evaluation, or SE and E, as it's referred to. Um, or in Anoka County, it's called a CPE and E. Um, they just like to call things differently because they're Anoka. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a financial early neutral evaluation. The social E and E and CPE and E deal with custody and parenting time issues. And that's all it deals with. And what that referral is for is for parties to meet with two individuals who are experts in the field of custody and parenting time. So usually the two experts are one psychologist or mental health worker and a second one who's an attorney. And typically they're actually um, different genders as well. Um, just so that if you have a mom and a dad, even if you don't have a mom and a dad, if you have two moms or two dads, it's still typically um, different gendered evaluators um, because people, it's been, studies have shown that people are more receptive if there's somebody there that they feel like is coming from their perspective, um, whether that be a gender perspective or, you know, I'm more of the custodial parent and I'm more of the um, less or less of the primary parent, you know, if they can identify with the people who are 
their evaluators, you tend to get a result much more quickly. Um, the evaluations, whether it's the financial or the social, are three hours long. Um, they're scheduled for a three hour block. And what's nice for people is that they're on a sliding fee scale. And so it's not just a lawyer's hourly rate or a mental health worker's hourly rate. Um, in Anoka, at least, they do a sliding fee based on the party's income, and each party will pay a different amount depending on what their income is. Um, in Hennepin and Ramsey, the way that they're doing it now is that if the parties are represented by an attorney, they do one half of that party's attorney's hourly rate. So say, for example, if my hourly rate was $200, my client would then have to pay $100 to the evaluators. And it's for both of the evaluators. It's not $100 each. Um, but that's one way that the parties have an opportunity to resolve custody and parenting time issues outside of court. If an agreement is reached, um, typically the evaluator will quickly write something up um, so that the parties can sign it before they leave. Um, but it's usually just a little outline of here's essentially what you've agreed to. Now go out and draft something that looks more like the stipulated agreement that was emailed to you um, to fill out and send to the court so the judge can sign that particular document. The E&E &E processes are confidential, just like mediation is. And um, what the judge finds out about an E&E &E is either yes, it was successful, or no, it was not successful. The judge won't find out anything else from the evaluator. Why it wasn't, you know, who left early, whatever that might be, the judge will never find that out. What the financial early neutral evaluation does is it allows parties to meet with one individual. It's typically a lawyer who's been practicing for a long time and done a lot of sort of complex divorces in terms of finances. And you'll meet with that person. They're usually really good with spreadsheets and Excel. So they have pretty things that go on the wall and they type stuff in and it adds it as you do it. And it's always extremely impressive. Um, people are usually just in awe at how numbers add up on their own. Um, but what the financial early neutral evaluation does is it provides a structure for two people to work out how their finances are going to be divided after the divorce. When we're talking about finances, one of the things that you might hear about from, from callers is, um, well, my divorce is finalized. I was supposed to get these retirement funds. And somehow the court was supposed to do that, or my lawyer, or the other party. It's called something called a QDRO. Um, or quadro, as attorneys refer to it. So it's a qualified domestic relations order. And what a qualified domestic relations order allows for is a transfer of retirement funds from one spouse to another through the process of divorce without having to pay taxes or the early withdrawal penalty. Uh, and you do that with 401ks, pensions, and some qualified R IRAs you're able to do that with. So it's a really great equalizing tool for parties when you're trying to equalize assets. If somebody has a lot of retirement and the other one doesn't, you can do these transfers, but it has to be done through the divorce and you have to have this extra order that's created. And a lot of times people forget to do that part. So you get your stipulated agreement, which was emailed to you. The judge sends it back, it's signed, and then they don't do any of the follow-up stuff. Follow-up stuff is create the order. And in order to create the qualified domestic relations order, you have to work with the plan administrator at the person's place of employment or whoever holds those funds. Um, and you also need to work with the court. So it has to be in a format that the business will accept. So whoever administers the retirement funds, it has to be in a form that they're going to accept, but it also has to be in a form that the court's going to accept. So usually there's a lot of kind of back and forth about, is this acceptable? Yes. Okay, send it to the judge. And the judge will typically sign it because businesses in Minnesota will know what Minnesota courts have deemed um, acceptable. Melissa, can I interrupt you just briefly? Yeah. Everyone, uh, Melissa has been referring a couple of times to the stipulation. That's the that's the Zoe handwritten stipulation, uh, fi stipulated findings of fact, conclusions of law that accompanied the materials when we sent the training materials to you. And so, and by the way. Um, just so you know, I did not copy all 40 pages of the order off. I just wanted you to have some idea of what it looked like for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of going through a divorce. So um, it gives you just some, some idea of, of, of how it works. And, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that when uh, Melissa is done. But go ahead. Sorry, Melissa. I just yeah, want no to make problem. sure everybody's on the same page. Thank you. Yeah. And so then, um, so with the quadro, so what would happen is with the stipulated <clears throat> 
findings of fact. A stip stipulated anything means that there was an agreement. So that means that the parties agreed to everything that's in this document and then gave it to the court and said, here's our agreement, um, sign off on it. If there's not agreement, there would not be stipulated on this particular document. It would be drafted by the court and it would come out after there had been an evidentiary hearing or a trial. Um, so after the parties have gone in for their initial case management conference, typically the early neutral evaluation will take place within a month or two. So it happens really quickly, um, which is a nice way to get things going. If there's not settlement at the initial case or at the e and &E, the next step will be that the parties will engage in what's called discovery. And discovery in family law is a little bit different than discovery in other areas um, of law, other areas of civil litigation, and that it's kind of informal. So lawyers, if you're working with lawyers, will typically send a letter that says, hey, can you provide me these documents? And then the lawyer send them. It's not some sort of formalized discovery. Now, if we don't get responses to our requests in an informal way, then we'll do the formal document requests um, and depositions. If you're gonna go, one thing that um, clients also don't understand is that in family law, you have a trial at the end of things if you can't come to agreement. And what those trials look like um, can be sometimes piecemeal. So you might have a, one hearing on one day, one month, and then another hearing on another day, another month if you don't get done. So they're not necessarily, oh, you're going for these three days and you're done after that. Um, it also is dependent on if there's any agreements. So it's not the situation where parties have to agree on everything in order to be done. It can be that maybe the parties agree on the labels of custody, um, on the division of the house, but they're having a hard time with the, how to divide the retirement funds and maybe about parenting time. Well, then you might have a trial just on parenting time, or you might have a trial just on um, how to divide the retirement funds. So it can be sort of separated and parsed out and which can make it feel a little bit longer. However, it's the court trying to come to, an, come to a full agreement as quickly as possible if we can just piece these little things out where you are disagreeing. Um, the other and, thing- and Melissa, can I just ask, um, is, it, is it a fair characterization that really from the beginning, the whole goal about the divorce process is to get people to reach an agreement? It's not to fight. That's, when yep. people are fighting, is that really kind of like the system has failed? When you have to have a hearing. When you, when you, I don't know if the system has failed. I would say the parties have failed. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. Uh, yeah. Mostly because the system really is trying to work in every single way possible to get to settlement. I was just telling Ellie before we came in here that I'm filing, or I have a motion hearing on Tuesday, and one of the new rules for motions in Minnesota is that you have to submit to the court 24 hours before your hearing this um, certificate of settlement and you have to explain all of your you don't have to explain what happened in the discussions but when the discussions took place um, whether you've attempted to do mediation if you don't submit it the court will cancel your hearing um, because the court wants you wants to know that the parties and they want to know who was the bad actor if you didn't come to a settlement so they want to know you know did the party not respond um, did the attorney not respond why didn't a settlement conversation take place because the court really wants things to be handled out of court. The reason for that is is because nobody knows a person's family better than them themselves. Judge doesn't know their family. Judge might have their own family that has their own problems probably <laughs> but they can't take their family and trans you know transpose it onto another family and say hey this is what works for my family or this is what works for most families it's gonna work for yours. Mm -hmm. So it works best if the parties can come to an agreement as to what's going to work for their family. And I think the most difficult part for people in this particular process is that they don't like each other. Um, you have to come to an agreement with somebody that you don't like anymore. You used to like them, but you don't anymore. And if you have kids, you're going to have to come to agreements with them for a long time about the kids, and you don't like that either. Um, particularly when you're dealing with parents, what can be difficult is parents sometimes need the kids more than the kids need the parents. And so when you're having conversations about parenting time 
and a parent says, well, my 16-year-old can't go without, can't be at the other parent's house for five days in a row because he can't go without me for that long. Um, the kid probably goes that long without wanting to be around that parent much longer than five days, but it's the parent who doesn't want to do that, which was the conversation that I had with an attorney this morning. Um, we have clients who are, um, both clients are in their 40s, the kids are 13, they're twins, and one parent saying, oh, I can't go four days, um, or the kids can't go four, four, four days in a row without seeing me, so we have to come up with a different schedule. Well. Actually, the kids probably can go four days without seeing. They go to camp every summer for two weeks at a time. I mean, there's clearly demonstrated um, instances where the kids go that long and the other person is their parent. It's not like you're sending them off to be with a stranger, right? Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with people's emotions when they're feeling abandoned by their significant other. They're trying to cling to their kids um, and try to maintain as much control as they can when it feels like their life is spinning out of control which is why family law can be sometimes more complex than just, can you give me your tax return so I can figure out what the number should be for your child support? Because you have to figure out what are all of these other psychological, mental health, emotional things that are going on for these people that are creating barriers to them coming to an agreement, which is usually when people call for help um, and call for assistance to get somewhere because they're so stuck. They can't see how tomorrow's ever gonna happen. Um, because they're so stuck in the conflict of today. And so your job is really important in helping guide them to that next step and saying, okay, I get it, you're frustrated. We've got these things called self-help centers. Um, there's different organizations that are going to be able to help you walk through. Um, if someone's in the thick of divorce and they are a pro se individual, one of the other really good resources is they don't need to go to a divorce information session because they probably got that done. The judge, you know, probably talked to them about what the next steps are. But maybe there's a sticky issue about what's fair parenting time or what does custody, what do the custody labels mean? I would recommend one of two things. Send them um, to a clinic at Chrysalis uh, or Tubman. I think they go by both names now. Uh, they have sessions where family law attorneys have volunteered their time to meet with individuals for, for 30 minutes at a time. It's usually, I think the people usually have to pay 20 bucks, but sometimes it's a little less depending on people's income. And it can be 30 minutes with a lawyer can answer a lot of questions, particularly because we tend to talk relatively quickly. Um, I used to volunteer there in their family law program, and I think Hopefully it helped people, you know, we're willing to look over documents, tell people what their next steps are. Um, so if they're in the middle of stuff, that can be really useful because it's hard for you guys to know maybe where their next legal um, avenue is taking them. But if they sit down with a lawyer, the lawyer will, by looking at a document, know exactly what the next step should be. So that's one option. I told uh, everyone yesterday that the other option would be People can call lawyers uh, anytime that they want to. And if I, if somebody calls me and wants to talk about their family law case, usually I end up on the phone with them for 15 minutes to 30 minutes, um, which I don't have their address. I don't have their credit card. I don't have anything like that. So I'm, I'm not charging for them for that time, but I'm giving them a little bit of ideas to what they're looking at or looking for, and most law firms are that way. It's not that you have to have an appointment and have to pay for it. There's usually an initial free consultation where you get a lot of information from it. So if they've tried Chrysalis, and, or if it's a friend of yours, whether you're working at work, you can always say, call a law firm and see if they do a free consultation, because quite a few will. There are some that won't. There are some that say, no, you have to have an appointment, and I'm gonna charge you for the time that we meet. Others, if you call, um, if you get a lawyer on the phone, we'll answer some questions for you in terms of process. So we're talking a little bit about discovery. Um, discovery happens, you know, if there's not settlement, but there's also settlement conversations going on through this whole thing. So you start the divorce and you start talking about settlement right away, which can be overwhelming for people because they're like, wait, I just started. And I'm like, I know, but we need to end this too. So um, it'll cost them a lot less money. The sooner they can get it settled, the less expensive it'll be. Um, and then they can send their kids to college instead of sending me to Europe. So, and that's usually what I tell people. It's your call, you get to make the decision, but this is where we are. Um, as we're doing the settlement and the litigating, so you're settling and litigating like at the same time because you can't forget to do either one of them. Um, 
if you are in a discovery process, there is something called a deposition that might be taken. And a deposition is when an individual comes into a lawyer's office and there's a court reporter there and the lawyer asks them questions on the record. Um, it's a way of recording testimony in case a party is unavailable on the day of trial or if you want to catch somebody lying because people will tell lawyers in their offices different things than they will tell judges in a courtroom with a bailiff sitting there after they've been sworn in. Um, suddenly it becomes a lot more real and so sometimes we'll do depositions to make sure that testimony stays consistent from one period of time to the next. Um, if you don't come to any settlement, you do have what's called an evidentiary hearing or a trial. Those are essentially the same words for the same action. So people sometimes get really freaked out when they hear that they're going to go to trial. Sometimes it's better if you say, oh, we're going to have an evidentiary hearing. It's the same thing. You go in, you give a little opening remark, you take some testimony, um, and then you typically the way family law closes is that you submit written findings to the court. You don't do an oral argument. But they're the same thing. So evidentiary hearing is collecting evidence, trials collecting evidence. Same difference, just has different terms and different courts use different terms for it. So Hennepin County always calls them evidentiary hearings. Um, Scott County and Carver County call them trials. And it's the same thing. So it sometimes freaks people out depending on what word has been used. Can I interrupt again? Yeah. Um, how many people here have gotten calls where, where callers are, are panicking because they've got a hearing or a trial coming up and they don't have a lawyer yet? Have, you, have we gotten any of those calls? No? Great. That's good. That means I have business, right? Good. <laughs> no. Okay, good. All right. Well, that, all right. that's interesting. Okay, thanks. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that um, while we're going through this whole process of trying to settle, when lawyers are looking at settlement, we're always thinking the end of all of this is going to be a trial in front of a judge. So in family law cases, there are no juries. It's always a judge or a referee. And what is the judge going to do? What can the judge do? So parties can agree to something much different than what a judge is going to order. But at the end of the day, if they don't come to an agreement, it's going to be the judge who gets to decide. And so frequently I'm talking to my clients about, okay, I get it. It's not your ideal situation, but here is ultimately what could be your result. And so I think that the better bet on this particular situation is if you take the agreement. Um, which is sometimes frustrating for people because they're like, well, I don't ever, I don't want to go to trial, so why are you talking to me about the, what, what the judge is going to do? And it's sometimes not somebody's choice whether they go to trial or not. You either agree or you disagree, and if you disagree, you have to go to trial. That's, that's the only option. So we, we're always keeping our judge in mind, and a lot of times we know judges and we understand um, sort of how they behave under certain circumstances. When we're talking about kid issues, I think one of the things that's really complicated and that people don't understand with regard to custody and parenting time is that there's essentially three things that have to be decided. You have to decide legal custody, which is what um, decision-making powers each parent has related to education, religion, schooling, all of like the big stuff, healthcare. Um, that's legal custody. And typically, as long as the parents can communicate in some form um, and it doesn't involve bloodshed or screaming fights or orders for protection, um, we will have situations where parties get joint legal custody. So they both, if they don't have significant mental health issues, will have the opportunity to have some say in you know, what school the kids go to and what doctors they see and what um, medical procedures are under, undertaken. Um, the second thing that has to be decided regarding kids is um, physical custody. Physical custody used to be a really big deal. Uh, the label of physical custody, so whether it's joint or sole, used to be a big deal because child support used to be dependent on physical custody. And when I say used to be, um, it changed in 2007. So really recently, um, the child support guidelines have changed and no longer is child support dependent on the label of physical custody. So people get really stuck on these labels, but 
in their everyday lives, does it matter? When it comes to making, you know, is the person going to be confirmed or are they going to have a bar mitzvah? Yeah, legal custody matters at that point in time. But when it matters, are they going to have macaroni and cheese for dinner or a salad? The label legal custody has nothing to do with that, right? And th those are the decisions most people are making on a day-to-day -day basis. So people get stuck on these labels because the legislature has built them up to be a big thing, but they're not that big a deal on a day-to-day -day basis with the kids. Um, so physical custody no longer matters for child support. Um, for the most part, that label doesn't matter because you can have a situation where you have one parent who has the title sole physical custodian and you have parenting time, which is the schedule that the kids are on, right, where they are at any given time, that's really close to 50-50. So it could be um, like 46% of the time with one parent, 54% um, of the time with the other, which is really close. It's like one to two nights a month that you're off of being 50-50. But the sole physical custodian has that label. It doesn't really matter because the schedule is what the schedule is and that's what's gonna really dictate how those kids are raised, right? Not whether a piece of paper says this person has this label. It's gonna be where do the kids exist on any given day. So I try to get my clients off of the physical custody label and just say, you know what, we'll deal with that later. What matters is how much time you get with your kids. And time now is called parenting time. It used to be called visitation. Now it's called parenting time um, to try to improve the image of what it is, right? When the kids are with the um, non-soul custodian, it's still time for them to parent. It's not, you know, going to McDonald's and playing in the, the bouncy house and those sorts of things. It's actually getting homework done and taking them to their activities and whatnot. Um, so those are the three things, legal custody, physical custody, and parenting time. Now, parenting time does play into child support. And the way that it plays into child support is child support is currently calculated on these tables that were created. Again, so the legislature is the one who creates all this stuff, right? So the people that you vote for and are in the House of Representatives and in the Senate are the ones who are making all these rules for all of us and the people who are calling you. So if people complain to me about it's not fair, I say, oh, well, guess what? In two years, you get to vote on a new person. You should probably think about that because I don't make the rules. I just follow them. Um, and so what we do with child support is now we calculate it based on both parents' incomes. Um, whoever pays health insurance, whoever is paying child care costs, we look at whether there are previous orders in place for child support for a non-joint child. So if somebody had a, a child with another person and there's already an order, um, whether the kids are receiving some sort of payments from the government for social security disability payments. Um, and then we look at how much time has been allotted to um, one or the other parent. So whichever parent has 50% or less, we look at how much time they have. If they have zero to 10% of the time, they just pay whatever the basic support obligation is after doing a calculation. If they have between 10 and 45% of the time, which is a huge difference in time amount, but it doesn't matter. They get a 12% reduction on their basic obligation. Then if they have 45.1% or more of the time, they get a greater reduction in their basic obligation and that's based on the party's incomes. One tool that I give my clients to always go and use on their own is the child support calculator that's provided by the Department of Human Services here in Minnesota. It's online, it's accessible by anyone that wants to use it. They have little hyperlinks on it so that you can figure out what goes into what box and what they're talking about when they ask for gross income, what does that mean? Um, so I would highly recommend if people have child support questions and how much they're gonna have to pay, direct them to the Department of Health website and the child support calculator. If you Google Minnesota Child Support Calculator, it'll be the first thing that pops up. If you go to the Department of Human Services website, it'll also be there. Any questions about child support? All right. I have a question about some things you said earlier. Yeah. Um, so the retirement that you were talking about earlier with the the person, so you're saying that the lawyer doesn't go to the person's job, it would actually have to be the 
the person that's expecting the retirement to be shared to call the other spouse's company or? No, it's usually the spouse. So my answer to that is it depends because if there's no, if there are no lawyers involved, so if both parties don't have a lawyer, then you would expect that the spouse who is giving the money, giving I use loosely, um, <laughs> demanded, who's demanded to overturn the money, they should probably approach their human resources person to figure out what to do. Right. Um, for lawyers, so if my client is told or you know has agreed to transfer some funds, I would be the one who contacts my client's employer or I'll have my client contact. A lot of times employers won't talk to lawyers just because we're lawyers doesn't mean that people like to talk to us. In fact, right. they usually don't like to talk to us. Um, and so I'll have my client, you know, call and say, here, I'll email them. I'll be like, this is exactly what I need you to say to your plan administrator as to what I need. And here's my contact information. Tell them that they can talk to me. And so that's what will happen. They'll communicate and then the plan administrator will get a hold of me. Um, but no, if there's lawyers involved, the lawyers will definitely be doing the drafting and all of the communication after that initial contact is made. But if there's not lawyers involved, that's when the parties have to do it themselves. And quadros are relatively complex. Mm -hmm. They're easily forgotten. I've had probably three people in the last two years contact me who had been divorced for between five to eight years each one of them, and they didn't have the quadros done. Because one of the things that really sometimes attorneys or parties forget to do is that last step. So you get your, so what happens is you submit your stipulated findings to the court, and then the court looks it over, says okay, and then they sign it, and they stamp it, and they send it back to you. And you say, yay, I'm divorced. You go out, you have champagne, you have a party, um, <laughs> or you cry. I don't know. <laughs> I did have one client complain that her divorce happened too quickly, oh. which I was, I was, uh, that, I'm like, that's going down in the record books because <laughs> usually people are like, why is this taking so long? Um, but just because you got this signed thing from the court doesn't mean everything's done. Mm -hmm. What people still have to do after they get this back is they have to make sure that their accounts are renamed or refinanced. So just because the court says, um, husband, you have to pay the American Express card and wife, you have to pay the Best Buy card. If wife's name is on the American Express and husband's name is on the Best Buy card, you're still on the hook for it. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that neither Best Buy nor American Express care what some right. judge in Minnesota said in your divorce. Mm -hmm. um, you're still responsible to pay it. So it's really important to get those things refinanced and out of your name. Mm -hmm. Same with the house. I have lots of people, particularly um, since the economic downturn, houses are hard mm -hmm. because people really came to depend on having equity in their house. Mm -hmm. You get divorced, people always get some money, you know, you get to move on and have your new life. Now the way it is with houses is that there's usually, houses are usually underwater. Mm -hmm. One person or the other is agreeing to stay and agreeing to pay for stuff, but they can't refinance because it's underwater. They can't get paid out. And so both people stay on the hook for the mortgage. And if one person stops to pay, it, it's gonna affect the other person's credit and the bank's gonna try to collect from them. Now we can't stop that process from happening, but what we typically put in our stipulated agreements or um, the court will put in their findings is that you indemn what's called indemnify and hold the other party harmless. So if if husband was supposed to pay the mortgage and he fails to do that and then somehow wife is harmed by that, wife could then go back and sue husband for whatever her damage was because of his failure to pay. Or if she has to then start paying, could sue for that. The issue is, is if husband's not paying, he probably doesn't have any money, so what's wife going to get anyway? Right. But that's one safety net you put in there. So wrapping things up at the end of things, so retitling your cars, making sure you know insurance, um, policies, have new beneficiary designations, getting your estate planning done, all of those things are sort of, now you're divorced, now what do you do? And it's, you continue to work on the rest of the divorce. Um, so that's one thing to remember. The other thing with regard to custody that I wanted to mention is that sometimes where people get stuck is that they can't figure out what a schedule should look like. You know, they're used to having their kids 100% of the time. Now they have to figure out how something different happens that's not 100% of the time. Um, 
And one resource that I send my clients to is something called the Arizona Planning for Parenting Time handout. If you Google that, it'll automatically come up. It's through the Arizona courts, which have laws that are similar to Minnesota, so that's why I refer them there. But what Arizona did is they did this huge study, um, and they worked with social workers and mental health professionals and attorneys and judges and anybody who might be involved in a custody dispute over the years. And they put together this packet of information that separates um, children based on age categories, so like zero to two. And it gives a variety of different schedules that work for child development purposes, that work for parenting purposes, that have been shown and demonstrate to produce, hopefully, healthy, responsible kids. Um, and what's nice is that they give you all different sorts of information about who this schedule would work for, who it might not work for, a variety of different ways to do schedules because when we're working on schedules, something that works for a newborn, which there are parents who get divorced or were never married and now they have a newborn, is not the same schedule that's gonna work for a 16 year old. So newborns typically do need to see their mom more frequently um, than a 16 year old might, logistically, you know, breastfeeding purposes. In addition to that, kids who are littler need to see people um, on a more frequent basis. If they go long times without seeing someone, they have a hard time tracking who that person is. Even if it's a parent, it can be hard to reacclimate if they're gone from each other for a long time. So I have lots of people who come in and, and they have a two-year-old and they're like, oh, we're gonna do a week on, week off. And that doesn't work for two-year-olds. It's too long to go without seeing one parent or the other to do a week on, week off. Now for a 16-year-old, that could be perfect, a week on, week off. You know, they know where they're gonna be for the full week for school. One parent is you know, tracking what homework is and activities for that week, and then the next parent has the next week. That's great. Every other day for a 16-year-old is not gonna work because nobody keeps track of where they are. The kid doesn't have any place that they really feel grounded. Um, and so you do have to look at where children are in development and what schedule is gonna work best for them. And sometimes it's not a convenient schedule for the parents. Um, but what we try to do in Minnesota is really have a child-based result for kids. So we have the best interest factors that we look at. And we look at ways to most accurately and successfully raise a child in a two-parent um, separate households. And it, children can be raised wonderfully in two households. It's been demonstrated over and over again that kids can do just fine what needs to happen is that there needs to be consistency, there needs to be dependability, and there needs to be parents who create support for each other. And that's not necessarily saying like, oh, that's the best person in the world, but not disparaging the other parent and making sure that the child knows that both parents love them and are there to support them, if that's the parent situation you have. And granted, that's not always the case. There are situations where one parent does not function at the same level. Um, in which case, in those situations, um, you can, there are resources available to try to structure parenting time in a way that allows that parent to be as successful as they can. So there's supervised parenting time that sometimes occurs where supervision can either take place at some um, organization that has been set up. So I think Cornerstone does supervised visitations for people, or it can be as easy as grandma and grandpa are there when mom or dad are with the kids or brother or sister and, and typically those are by agreement. You know, if the um, custodial parent is comfortable with a brother or sister or, or a mom or a dad being there, it can happen that way. Which helps cut down on costs for people because if you use a visitation center, it's actually really expensive because you're paying time for the individual who's sitting there observing the parenting time. It's awkward because your kid's going to like a place and they're meeting in a room where somebody's watching them through a glass window. It's it's not an ideal situation. So if, if you can find ways to structure parenting time that's a little bit more conducive to having a natural interaction, that's usually the best way to do it. And, the, and when, when we've got issues about parenting, um, it, it's co called co-parenting, correct? Between the parents as, as to how they- We hope it's co-parenting. Co-parenting, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you, the goal is to have good co-parenting. That is the goal, yep, definitely is the goal. For visitation, um, if you have, say, grandma or grandpa sitting there, do they have to go through a class or anything to be able to be, be a supervisor? That? Yeah. 
Um, not necessarily. It depends on the level of supervision and why the supervision is taking place. So if you have supervision taking place because mom or dad has some sort of um, domestic violence or criminal issue related to children, then there would probably be some necessary training to take place. And I don't know that a relative would want to participate in that way. Sometimes supervised visitation is because um, maybe one parent likes to drink a little bit and they've agreed that they won't drink during parenting time, but the other parent doesn't really trust that they won't drink. So they want somebody else there just in case something like that happens. Um, and people's comfort levels, you know, with drinking range. So they don't want a beer, you know, and other people are like, oh, you can have, you can go to the game and have a couple beers with your friends and take the kid. That's fine. People have different ranges of, so that's why supervised visitation also has some different ranges. Um, a lot of times you see family members doing it if uh, the parent who's having parenting time is like granted overnights and shouldn't be alone with the kids maybe overnight. They'll have somebody there to just sort of keep an eye on them. And it's not as if they have to interact the whole time, but they have to be there in case something happens is essentially what it is. And, you know, and uh, thankfully, in a lot of my cases, I don't see that happening very often. Other law firms deal more with situations where there are orders for protection or I would say probably legal aid, um, volunteer lawyers network, those places um, probably deal with it a little bit more than private attorneys do. Um, when there are issues related to child custody or child support that take place in two different states, so say one person's in Wisconsin and the other person is in Minnesota, those are governed actually by federal statutes. Um, one, or uniform laws, I should say. The law that governs child custody is called the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Enforcement Act, or we refer to it as the UCCJEA. What that has done, it's been adopted by 49 states. So the federal government came up with it and said, here we go, this is what we suggest that you states do. Because there's conflict between states since each state gets to determine their own family law rules. Here's something that we think will work if you adopt this. 49 states have adopted it. Massachusetts is in the process of trying to get it adopted through their legislature. But what it essentially says is, here is the state that will have jurisdiction over a child. It's either that the child has lived there for six months, um, or if they haven't lived there for six months, there are substantial contacts, which are explained more within the statute. It's an emergency situation, which is also explained more in the statute, and I won't go into. Um, or if none of those things fit, then it's gonna be the last place that the kid was, or the last place that had a court order with the kid. Um, people move so much now that it was really important that there be some sort of uniformity in terms of which court gets to make decisions about this. So that's what jurisdiction means. It means which court has the authority to tell you what to do. So if I go to Wisconsin and um, have a kid and live there for you know six months and then I come back to Minnesota, I can't file in Minnesota for custody or parenting time or child support because Minnesota doesn't have jurisdiction over me or the kid. I haven't been here long enough and neither has the child. Wisconsin would have that jurisdiction. In Minnesota, you have to be here for 180 days in order to file for divorce or custody or parenting time um, or child support, unless there's some sort of an emergency, uh, which you would have to explain to the court. So essentially, there's this uniform law that governs which state gets to say what happens with regard to custody of a child. Now, with regard to child support, there is the um, Uniform Child Support Enforcement Act. And that is actually managed by the federal government. So there's an office at the Department of Human Services for the federal government that if there are child support orders in one state and a kid is living in another state, or um, there are two conflicting child support orders, Typically, it'll have gone through this office and they're trying to figure out who pays what. Um, it usually happens when the child is on some sort of public assistance. So if the child is on Minnesota Care or um, food stamps or WIC, 
the federal government gets a little kickback from Minnesota if Minnesota's collecting child support. Minnesota also gets a little kickback if the kid is on Minnesota Care and Minnesota's collecting child support. So the state has an interest in keeping track of child support and making sure that it gets paid. <coughs> um, the federal government has an interest in child support and making child support get making sure child support gets paid. And so through all of those avenues, um, the federal government or a state can collect child support if an individual is residing in that state by either intercepting taxes, um, garnishing wages, and then there are penalties if people fail to pay and don't have any of those other alternative collection methods in order to pay. Any questions about sort of those two areas, so the <coughs> interstate child custody and interstate child support are relatively complex issues, um, particularly the child support. I've had people come in who have lived in five different states, had child support being collected in all five states at the same time for different amounts, and they're just trying to figure out if they still owe money because they think that they don't. They feel like they paid everything that they were supposed to pay. All The kids are, have graduated from high school, no longer have support obligations, but there was an arrears, and it can be really complicated. So it's hard for people to figure out on their own. Child support workers at the counties, not always the most friendly people to deal with. Um, they're, I mean, they have a, a lot of stress and a lot of work that they have to do, and so I think that they're not as patient with pro se individuals as I would want them to be. They're not as patient with attorneys as I would want them to be. So uh, child support is hard. When does it get to a point if someone goes to jail because not paying child support? That's a, it's really dependent on the judge mm -hmm. that you get. Some judges like to send people to jail. Some judges see that if people are out of jail, they're going to make more money than if they're in jail. So keep them out of jail sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Depends on if you have an attorney on the other side who that's what they're requesting. And it depends on how you really have to have a willful disregard for payment. So there has to be this sort of this willful, um, willful means intentional. So like this intentional non-payment. It's not, I don't have enough education, I can't get a job. Those things are not willful disregard for your obligation and you won't go to, you won't go to jail for that. If it's your uh, construction worker and you work 60 hours a week and you get paid in cash and you never put any of that in the bank and there's documents that show that you're working, such as you know, timesheets and what have you and everybody knows that that's the work you do and you don't pay, then you're probably gonna go to jail at some point. Um, but they'll do other things before sending you to jail. So your driver's license will be suspended, you won't be able to hunt or fish, um, <laughs> Which can sometimes, it's a big, I mean, it's a big deal to some people, this hunting and fishing license suspension. If, if you're a lawyer, you can get disbarred. If you're a doctor, you can have your license suspended. So it's pretty, nurses can have their licenses. Anything that has a license, it can be suspended if you fail to pay. Um, and I've actually seen judges more willing to send people to jail for non-payment of spousal maintenance than child support, which really makes people upset. Um, because they really don't want to pay their ex-spouse money. Um, as far as back child support, if your child support has, if your child support order has ended and you do have a, you know, back child support, has there ever, I mean, has there ever been like agreements where that gets nixed, or, um, you know, if you've been working, holding down a job, um, paying all of your obligated child supports, and you still have a balance, do you are you always you know, compelled to have to pay that? Um, or is that is the state ever just say, okay? The state won't ever say that. Um, the other party might, and if you come to an agreement and the state doesn't have an interest in it, then there might be a chance that you could have your arrearage waived. The other party has to agree, agree. to it? Yep. So even if, okay, even if they're, all right, well. Yeah. So sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's a situation where there's an arrearage. Everybody understands that somebody went through a hard time and they just didn't go in. The thing is, 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 is as soon as there's a change in circumstances, you should go in to get a modification of child support. 
hands down, that's what you need to do. If you don't take that step, then it's just going to continue to accrue. So you don't take that step. You went through this hard time. It just, all this child support accrued during that period of time. Um, if the state has an interest in it, so for some reason the state wants a piece of that money, they're not going to waive it. I mean, anytime the state wants money, they might negotiate it down a little bit, but they're not, it's never going to go away. Um, and the other party, if you start to get along, it might be the situation where they're like, yeah, the kids are 25 and 26. It's ridiculous that I still get these checks. If you're getting along, mind you. Um, if they're not getting along, that other party is going to say, no, I should have had that when the kids were 10 and 11 and I didn't. And we really struggled. And I'm trying to make up for lost time. And that's so why. So I was under the impression that you'd be paying the state back at that point. If, it goes if through the child has already turned 18, but you're saying the, the other person would continue to collect. Yep. Directly. So it goes through the state. I see. If you have an, arre if you have an arrearage um, and it's been reduced to a judgment, the state the state or the county is the one who's doing the collections. So they get to keep a portion and then they send the rest on. I see. Yeah. Well, let's see, you have about um, 10 minutes All right. left, if you could. Sure. So then the final thing that I wanted mm -hmm. to touch on, because I think it's becoming more and more prevalent, is this grandparent visitation, third party visitation, um, grandparent custody or third party custody. As I was saying before, grandparents, we all know who those are. Those are the people whose kids have had kids. Um, third parties are individuals such as significant others, um, boyfriends, girlfriends, um, step parents sometimes can be considered third parties. Um, it doesn't include foster parents, but it does include essentially any individual who doesn't have some sort of legal or biological connection to the child however, has established a relationship with the child and lived with them for a certain period of time. The statute related to grandparent visitation and third-party custody is relatively complex in terms of what you need to establish to even get into court. Grandparents are a little easier uh, in terms of what you need to establish, but for third parties, there's some hurdles that you have to jump through or, or establish before the court will hear your petition. And I won't go into the details about that, but I think a lot of times people who are boyfriends or girlfriends um, or significant others of someone who have a, formed an attachment, lived with the child, feel like they don't have any recourse to establish some sort of connection with them after that relationship is no longer working out. But they do. Um, so what they can do is they can petition the court to have some time with the kids. Um, for third-party visitation and grandparent visitation, it's never going to be a 50-50 sort of visitation situation. Um, recently, the Court of Appeals came out with a decision here in Minnesota where a district court had granted between a dad and the grandma of a mom who died. Um, the district court for a baby, the district court had ordered, yes, it was kind of a 50-50 schedule between the grandma and the dad. Um, and the Court of Appeals overturned that and said no. Um, this looks more like a custodial arrangement for people, and so that's not what grandparents are, and this child still has a surviving parent, so it's going to be something different. Um, so it was reduced to, I think, from 50-50, I think it went down to about 30% of the time. Now, for third parties who aren't grandparents, I've seen it go up to about 45, almost 50%. Um, and I've seen this in situations, there's a case called Suhu versus Johnson, which was two women who had adopted two kids from China, um, and only one of them had done the legal adoption, the other one hadn't uh, legally adopted the kids, but they lived together in a relationship. They raised these two children together for, I think it was 12 years, and then their relationship didn't work out. And the non-legal parent said, hey, wait a minute, like I need, like these are my kids, you can't just say that I don't get them anymore. In that case, it was close to 50-50 that the actually Supreme Court has sanctioned for that. So it's dependent on circumstances and no situation is the same. Much like no divorce is the same, no custody action is the same, and just because your mom's divorce went one way does not mean your divorce is gonna go that way. And just because your best friend gets this much in child support doesn't mean you're gonna get the same, even if you have the same number of kids and you make relatively, um, the same amounts of money because nobody ever tells the truth about money and nobody ever tells the truth about their divorces 
or their custody actions or their child support. It's always, not always, it's usually worse in their story. And you don't know the other side, right? We all tell stories from our perspective. And so when you hear people say, my friend or my cousin or my mom, I always say, I don't care what happened with those people. <laughs> you need to care about what's happening in your situation. Um, a great resource for individuals who need help with grandparent visitation or third party visitation or custody is the Minnesota Kinship Caregivers uh, website and organization. Although they're not always available via telephone, they do have a referral service for attorneys. Um, and so they'll refer it out to individuals who have expressed an interest in third party custody issues, as well as had demonstrate um, knowledge and experience in that area. So I'm on their referral list. Um, they also have great like pamphlets and checklists and support groups for individuals who are finding themselves in these situations, um, particularly grandparents or aunts and uncles who suddenly find themselves thinking either they weren't gonna have kids or they've raised their kids and now they have a five-year-old um, or a two-year-old. It can be really hard to figure out now what do I do? If you have two parents who are still alive, they're just not capable of taking care of the kids, how does grandma get them, the kid signed up for school? How does grandma give permission for the kid to go on a field trip or you know to summer camp? How does grandma give permission for the child to get some sort of treatment at the doctor? So those sorts of things the Kinship Caregivers website helps out with, lawyers will help out with as well in terms of figuring out how you get that stuff done. And I say grandma just because it, it seems to be that happens more often than not, um, but it can you know, be grandpa or aunt or uncle or brother or sister who find themselves in that sort of situation. And sometimes you need a permanent solution and sometimes people just need some temporary help while somebody's you know, in treatment or getting assistance with some sort of issue that they might have. So any questions about the grandparent or third party custody? Or anything else that we've talked about that I maybe didn't cover? Yeah. Um, well, I just have a, a question about um, a news article I read about a guy, I think it was in Kansas, who had responded to a Craigslist ad for a sperm donor for a lesbian couple who wanted a child. And then um, it was supposed to be completely like, here you go, have your baby, I'm out of the picture. And he, he donated it. He didn't ask for any money or anything. And then... Um, the couple ended up going on assistance and the child ended up on state assistance and now the state is going after the donor for yep. child support. Yep. Wow. Yes. And, and yeah, I read that too. Yeah. I was just wondering what your take on that is. That will happen and I tell, so I do, so that's called assisted reproductive technology is when all of that takes place so you're not, <laughs> you're not going the natural route about conceiving the child and I, I deal with those individuals um, quite frequently. And what I tell people is when they're gonna use a known donor, the way that the law, the law in Minnesota is very deficient with regard to assisted reproductive technology, whether it's for same-sex couples or heterosexual couples who have the same reproductive issues sometimes that um, same-sex couples do. The law is extremely deficient and there's probably gonna be a lot of talk in the legislature about getting something through to sort of patch some of these loopholes that are there. <coughs> so right now, assisted reproductive technology legislation in Minnesota is such that it only covers heterosexual married spouses in situations where they've sought the assistance of a physician to help them reproduce and that the donated sperm is supplied by the doctor to the woman at the clinic when the husband has signed off on it. That is the only situation that is technically covered by law. Any other situation, people are sort of free for all, okay? So what happens is that if, if I have clients who have gone to a sperm bank Typically, the sperm bank then delivers it to the doctor. The doctor gives it to the people, and they can do it at home. Or the doctor might do it at the office or whatever it might be. Um, typically, that cuts off sort of anything, anything being known about that sperm donor because that's technically confidential. If you use a known donor, 
it is so risky. And I always tell my clients this, but they just love who this guy is or whatever it might be, or they love the surrogate and they know that nothing's ever going to happen. And that's so not true. But what happens is that you actually cannot ever terminate parental rights until you have a court that terminates them. The way that we terminate parental rights is typically through a second parent adoption. So if I have a lesbian couple that comes to see me for a because they're so excited because they're having this baby and they had their friend who donated the sperm to them and um, he's really excited because he's going to be known as you know uncle bob and you know they have it all worked out how it's going to work out well uncle bob is dad under the law until the court has approved the second parent adoption and terminated uncle bob's rights um so there's this period of time during pregnancy and after the child is born, because you can't do any of the adoption or the termination of parental rights until after the child exists. And it usually takes about six months after the child exists. So there's a 15 month period of time where Uncle Bob is the legal parent of the baby. So if something happens to the mom that's carrying the child, it's Bob who is on the line for child support and taking care of the kid and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, he can waive his rights after the child is born, which is also a co complicated, or you know, if he were to become in possession of this child that he didn't want, it's also a complicated procedure. And what does that mean for future ability for him to get a child if he wants a child? Because if you have terminated your parental rights, that has to be disclosed if you then want to adopt later. Um, so it gets really complicated and yes, that will happen. That's in the category of no good deed goes unpunished. Right. <laughs> and there's even, some there's even some question in Minnesota as to whether through a second parent adoption you can completely terminate that other parent's rights or if the court has such an interest that if they know who that person is, if they could then go after them. So are they, are they legally obligated to disclose that name? It, well, you would be lying to the court if you didn't. So yeah. Well, can you just say I? I won't tell you. I mean, you're not. That way, you're not lying. That's then actually, the court. That's and, what they tried to do in Kansas. They actually yeah. tried not to tell, and and uh, the, essentially they were faced with the state refusing to support. provide in, any more support. I mean, most people are going to give it up at that point. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I, I mean, the state's going to refuse to do whatever you're asking them to do for you. They're going to say, "Sorry, you won't tell us. We won't." provide you with this because we don't have to unless you tell us and we know that your child was not immaculately conceived <laughs> it's only happened once in you know one religious understanding so it's that's probably not how it happened so there's got to be somebody out there somewhere and on that note we're going <laughs> to end that's the most exciting part of this talk <laughs> now we're done and Melissa, you have done a fan and fantastic job once again. Thanks. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And Dan will go off for a second, if we could. Uh, then we'll, we'll be over. Uh, that, I think that was a really um, productive uh, um, session. And, you know, the sticky family law stuff is really sticky. I mean, it's a reason for that. Um, and Melissa did talk about the emotion, and I'm sure you're getting your callers, many of them are emotional when they're dealing with family law things, and there's really just no way to deal with it other than I think the best thing that you can do is assure them they will survive it, they'll get through it, here are some resources for you, good luck, take care of yourself as you go through the process. Um, and um, in terms of triaging, uh, there is one, one thing that you can do, and you can do it fairly simply. And that is ask if they have children. So if they're calling about family law issues and they, and they say, we don't have children, all right, that the odds of them and the chances of them being able to um, navigate the system on a pro se basis without lawyers is greatly enhanced. So your primary referral for people who don't have children can be the court self-help centers. They can really, for the most part, you know, I mean, there are exceptions, but for the most part. With children, you know, obviously still give the Court Self-Help Center as a referral, but, um, you know, those folks are uh, more likely in need of volunteer lawyers, so it's a Tubman referral or something uh, along the lines where at least they can get um, some volunteer lawyers assigned to them. Um, 
One of the other questions uh, that we had um, in, in this is, I, I'm, I'm wondering how often, are, how often are we referring callers to the 211 website, uh, to, to, to the Call for Justice website? Are, you, are we doing it with any frequency? No? Okay. Well, the reason I ask is that we have a fairly comprehensive list of, of certainly social service providers. All, the, all of the training of uh, legal providers, all of the training materials are on our website. The videos that we are now doing are on the websites. And in addition to that, we have, we have uh, the alternative 211 caller um, button under our tag for other resources for help. Resources for help. So if you, if you hit resources for help and then they scroll down, they'll come to alternative 211 callers. That is where the, the, the Walling um, and, uh, and um, Berg firm will be. That's where Melissa's firm will be. That's where Cooper and Reed, the low bono, low fee uh, law firm is. Um, and uh, we will put uh, Steve Snyder on there as well. And, and, um, and the reason being, these are in technically for-profit law firms. And, you know, as, as um, we've agreed with um, our process here, that it's okay for you to, you can't give those names out, but it's okay for you to say, but there are other resources that may be able to help you legal resources, go to the Call for Justice website, and then scroll down to Alternative 211 Referrals. So uh, we... But are those low cost? Re would that be a low cost referral for them, or well, just a referral? Well, uh, Cooper, Cooper and Reed certainly are low bono. So they're, they're a moderate fee uh, range. So um, their, their rates start at $99 an hour. Um, whereas the typical uh, divorce uh, lawyer is going from 200 to 450 to 500 dollars an hour, so that is. However, what you all got was a great little tip from Melissa today, which essentially was call a lawyer, tell them you have this problem, Get pick their brain, you know, and they and they will give you 15 minutes. Sorry, legal profession. I think <laughs> this is um, this is one of the realities now. And you may find, they may find lawyers who are willing to work with them on the fee. So, um, and sometimes it does take callers to be educated. You know, remember we've talked in the past about my old saying that, you know, um, when I used to practice law, my saying was, um, you know, you're always supposed to worry about a rainy day. Well, now it's in a, you know, it's a, it's a thundering downpour. It's time for you to, to reach out to other resources. You know, Aunt Matilda, or you know, somebody that's got some money under a mattress. And so, sometimes callers, though, people need to be educated about that because there are still many people who believe that there are so many free lawyers out there. I should be able to find a free lawyer rather than have to pay for it, even though they have some resources where they can pay for it. I've just got to tell you, there aren't a whole lot of people running around looking for that free auto mechanic. You know, I mean, people have a problem with their car. <laughs> they look for, you know, they, they understand that they have to pay for it. So, so anyway, it's all an education process. It's a communication process. Is that law firm that you just mentioned about the low bono, is, are they part of that low bono project or the modest means no. law project? No, and so let me come to that because that's on my list. But now, Mary, that you've raised it, it is important. And I know that we've been, we have been making referrals to the Ramsey County and Hennepin County bar low fee panels and their low fee services. In Hennepin, it is only for family law. In Ramsey, it's across the board. Here is what we're hearing. In Hennepin, we're hearing that they have increased calls, which I believe is in part due to our work here um, and your work. Um, and, and even though the calls are increasing, they're keeping up with them. So they've got enough attorneys. We're hearing over in Ramsey which has broader service. It's not only limited to family, it's limited, I mean, they'll do anything. They'll do consumer law, they'll do um, employment-related things. We're hearing that they have more lawyers than they have callers. So, you know, if they're in, and remember, Ramsey will go, they will refer outside of Ramsey County as well. So if the caller is from Hennepin, they'll refer them to a Ramsey County low-fee lawyer, and that, it's up to that low-fee lawyer in Ramsey to work with the Hennepin person, but they will do that. They, they don't just exclude it only on county basis. So very important. Um, 
and we, you know, we are somewhat of a, uh, a loss to understand why Ramsey is low, but please bear that in mind with your Our callers. Our callers are more Hennepin. I mean, yeah. right? Overall. Yeah. Okay, but remember now, Ramsey, I'm reinforcing, Ramsey will take people from right. Hennepin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give them that referral. Um, and, you know, uh, grandparent law, interstate um, custody issues, very specialized, and we've given you the resources here. We did get um, more than one resource telling us about the Minnesota Kinship Caregivers Association. And I'm just interested, before this training, have any of you given referrals to that organization in the yes. past? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, now you know. They will do the legal referrals, you know, so get the person to them for their, instead of hotline, their warm line. But that's okay. That's great. Um, I, I did want to say uh, the stipulation that you received, um, you know, that, that the, you know, the 12 pages that are, you know, originally 40. Finally, we need to say one, one thing about Zoe. Zoe's divorced. And she got divorced, and, and she did it through, through this stipulation here. And Herman came to his senses a little bit, and they were finally into a position where they were able to agree on things and get a divorce. The bottom line with divorces is, if you go to a judge, you're, nobody's going to be happy, all right? If you do, if you do a settlement and agreement by yourself, you know, with the other party, and you reach agreement, you're still not going to be necessarily happy, but you're going to be far happier than if you let a judge do it, you know, and. Now, we don't, you know, that's just for your understanding. I mean, that's not the kind of thing to be talking with people on the telephone about because, you know, they have to make their own decisions about things and, and we just do the referrals and get them to a resource where they can get educated about what decision they need to make. But the reality is, just so you know this, you're involved in the system, is that um, really, it, 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 I've never, ever heard anyone go through a trial whether it's for family law or something else, and say, boy, gosh, I got out of that result everything I wanted. It just doesn't work that way. I did. Oh, <laughs> well, there's always exceptions. <laughs> um, all right, uh, and then last but not least, um, uh, I think that that really pretty much covers it. Um, anybody have any questions? That 24-hour submission of the the document that she was talking about. Um, is the court really reading that in 24 hours? I mean, because how many, how many cases do they have? Are you, you asking know? about this, the settlement that, that she has to stipulate? Yeah, that, that 24 hour submission that she has to give. Like, how do they even have time to read over that before? No, what it, no, what it is is that before, 24 hours before the hearing, mm -hmm. they have to they have to file something that says they've tried to have a settlement. Mm -hmm. So when the court considers the motion, okay, mm -hmm. so the motion comes up, then that sheet, that certification, is attached to the motion. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's not, a, it's not a long document that they're doing. I mean, they just oh, okay. have to, they have to just sort of lay out in a, a two or three paragraphs, this is what we've done. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a, gate, a gateway in order for the court to consider the motion. Oh, okay. right. So, all right. Um, at that, uh, that note, we're going to go off, and then Jillian has a quick survey. Um,